Good morning. I want to welcome you guys to Fellowship Renewed Church. I'm glad you are here uh, with us today as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as we come and we hear his word being taught. Um, and I've got Matthew coming up. He's got uh, something he wants to let you guys know about, and then we'll continue on. So here's Matthew. Good morning. My name is Matthew, in case I haven't met you yet. I uh, just want to give you a little bit of information on Men's Fellowship. It's not until December 3rd, uh, from 5 to 7, happens the first Sunday of every month, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an elevator pitch on what's going on. You might be thinking, why do I need that? Because Men's Fellowship's been going on for quite a while. Well, it's had a bit of a change in management, uh, myself and two other guys, and you'll be hearing from them in the coming Sundays leading up to the next coming uh, Men's Fellowship. 
And I kind of just wanted to give you a heads up on the mentality of it, how it's changed, because we kind of wanted to take a step back and decide, like, what, what does fellowship mean to us? Because obviously this is Fellowship Renewed Church. This is men's fellowship, so uh, we need to put the correct respect on that term, figure out what it means to us, how we can best put that into practice through uh, men's fellowship. So the way that we're doing that is we're trying to be a little, a little bit more intimate, a little bit more intentional, trying to have more intense conversations, learn more about each other beyond, hey, what's your name and what do you do for a living? We want to find out how we can more effectively pray for each other, how we can more effectively lift each other up and love on each other. So to give kind of a just a quick example of how that works, uh, we've been doing this for the past two men's fellowships. And the last one, the big discussion uh, that we had was over what scripture or spiritual, spiritual concepts do you struggle with? Like, just diving deep on, like, what, what are you bad at? <laughs> so we can kind of help each other navigate that. Like, this is something I struggle with, but I'm in here in a room with people of varying ages. This isn't marketed specifically to, to young adults. They've, they've got their own thing. Uh, it's not specific, specifically marketed to middle age or the, the elderly. It's, it's everybody. So people from different walks of life that have varying levels of experience with Scripture and in their spiritual walk with Christ that can kind of give each other a hand. Be like, hey, I've struggled with that too, but this, this is where I'm at now. Uh, hey, I currently struggle with that, but I'll pray for you, and we can kind of keep tabs on each other. It adds accountability, and I think it's a pretty good example of what fellowship should be. So if you're interested in that, this is your first heads up. It's still a while away, so clear your calendar, but there you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, I missed the one in October, but I, I went to the one this previous month, and um, it was really refreshing because, you know, oftentimes – um, when we get together, I mean, when you guys have conversation after service and stuff, like, how spiritual does it get? Like, like how, how deep into your spiritual life do you talk? And it's probably not really much, right? Um, we, we don't get together a lot and talk about spiritual things, and, and it was really refreshing to go to this and just have some guys open up about, man, here's, here's some verses I've struggled with, or here's a, here's a theology I've struggled with, and us all just encourage each other then and talk about it, um, it's a really good time. So I want to encourage you guys, if you can, um, set those times aside and, and come be a part of, of what the Men's Fellowship is doing now. Um, it, it is really good. <clears throat> um, as we do every week before we continue in worship, we do want to give you a moment to spend in prayer. Um, and again, it's just a time for you to kind of focus your heart and your mind on um, why we're here, what, why we're singing these songs. Um, and I've got a few verses I want to read for you, just something to think about today. This is Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. And it says, In you, which is all of us, right? In you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And I just thought, man, this is so awesome, because we're, we're about to sing um, a song called All Sufficient Merit. We sung it, uh, I think, a week or two ago. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the principle of the song, is that you had a debt that you couldn't pay, but that debt's been, it's been filled. And, and, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, someday I'm going to get a letter from my mortgage company that says your debt has been paid. And it's like, man, that is going to be such a glorious day when, the, when my debt has been paid and I don't have a house payment. Like, but, but how much more glorious is it that our sin debt was paid, that we don't have to stand before God and answer for our sins and, and take his wrath upon ourselves? Like, we, could, we couldn't do that. That's what hell is for. You will constantly take the wrath of God for your sins. But Jesus went to the cross and took the wrath for us. And that's what we're going to sing about. And it's so glorious that you don't have a sin debt. That debt was paid, and it was paid at the cross. And, man, I just hope they get you excited, that, that when you stand and you sing, that you're excited about what Jesus has done for you. You're excited that you don't have to stand before God and answer for your sinfulness, that Jesus took that upon himself. And that's why we gather. That's why we sing, um, because he took it all. Our debt's been paid. Um, so let's pray together. We will take our morning offering and we'll continue worship. So pray with me. Lord, again, we are just so grateful, God. 
that you loved us enough that, God, even though we were sinful, as your scripture says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. God, that you were merciful and gracious toward us. Lord, that you looked upon your perfect son and you poured out the wrath that I deserved for my sins upon him. And God, that he went to the cross and he died. But Lord, he didn't stay dead. Lord, he defeated sin, he defeated death by stepping out of the grave, by resurrecting to your right hand. And God, we know that we too will have a future resurrection because of what Jesus did. God, thank you so much for paying our debt. Lord, I pray that as we stand and we worship you, God, that we praise you for who you are and for what you've done. Lord, I pray that as we come and we give this morning, we give with a heart of gratitude, knowing that everything that we have, God, has been given by you. So, Lord, help us glorify you with our song. Help us glorify you with our time of teaching. Lord, again, by your spirit, give us understanding. Give us help. What your word has to say to us. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can stand and come place your offer in the giving box.
Corinthians chapter 15. This is verses 19 through 26. 
If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end. And he delivers the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Let's sing about this together, Glorious Day. Jesus came for to be born of a virgin and dwelt among men. My example is He. Word became flesh and the light shined.
dying, he saved me and buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified, free me forever. One day is coming, a glorious day. you've done for us in Christ Jesus, our Savior. God, we await that glorious day, and until we do, we seek to give you glory here and now, and we have come to you with our hearts open and our minds uh, filled with and informed by your word according to your spirit, and Lord, I pray now that as we open your word, that you would continue to teach us, lead us, and guide us into all truth and all righteousness. We desire that we would become conformed to the image of Christ today, and I pray that you would do that work here and among us. We desire to honor you with this time, and we pray this all together in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 together today, 1 Corinthians 7, and so I'll invite you to turn there with me, please. Now, there are a few new faces here today, and so I'll just let you know that we've been working through the book of 1 Corinthians together, and we have come to chapter 7. So chapter 7 was not random, a random choice this morning, but we have actually started at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1, and we have worked all the way here this morning, okay? And uh, as we begin, I'd like to just read this text, and uh, and we'll begin our time together, okay? So let's all turn our attention to the text, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. Okay, that's our text for this morning. As we've been going through this book together, there are really two major section divisions that we need to be aware of, and we just came out of one and we're starting a new one today. Okay, so let's look at those together. Uh, sections of the letter. The first section of the letter that we looked at together was concerning the reports about the church. And there were two reports. The first report was about quarreling in the church, and that took us from chapter 1, verse 10, all the way to chapter 4, verse 21. And then there was a second report about sexual immorality in the church, and that was from 5, 1 to about 6, 20. And we spent quite a bit of time on this section. We're coming out of that section now and starting a new section. What is this new section? This new section is concerning matters about which you, that is they, wrote. Okay? So we've come out of the reports concerning the church. So what what were these reports? These reports, by the way, were reports given to Paul by people who had been traveling through the area and had learned things about the Corinthian church that they thought, Paul, you need to be aware of some things that are going on there that you're probably not pleased with. And so we're reporting these things about the church to you, and Paul responds to those reports in chapters 1 through 6. 
now that we've come to chapter 7, something different is ha- taking place. Now they, the Corinthians, wrote to Paul about several issues, several things, and uh, we have them here uh, concerning marriage, concerning food offered to idols, concerning spiritual gifts, and concerning the collection for the saints. Um, we see these different words scattered throughout because he'll say, now, concerning marriage. Now concerning food offered to idols. Now concerning spiritual gifts. You get the idea. He uses this language as a signal to shift from one idea to another regarding the things they asked him about. Okay? That's what the rest of the letter is going to have to offer. Now, just as he would, as he explains these things, he'll go off on rabbit trails. But they're not unrelated. They're very much related. So we have a lot of things to cover from here till then, but generally speaking, the skeleton of this whole entire last section, which will take us to the end of the book, is about matters concerning the things they wrote to Paul about. And what is the first thing they wrote about? It was concerning marriage. And we're going to zoom in just a little bit on concerning marriage because there are several different points about marriage that they wrote to him about that he's going to address. Concerning marriage, yes, but inside of concerning marriage, there are a few ideas. The first idea is concerning intimacy. The second idea is concerning singleness. The third idea is concerning divorce. The fourth idea is concerning calling and condition. And then the last being good order and devotion. Okay, so when he's talking about marriage, he's first going to talk about marital intimacy. Okay? And for those in the room, I'm going to be referring to marital intimacy quite a bit. And for those of you who understand what I mean by that, please understand what I mean by that. This is what he's talking about. And the phrase I'm going to use this morning is marital intimacy. Okay? Marital intimacy, things concerning marriage. All right. So we're going to start outside of our text this morning because I think there's an elephant in the room, okay? We just read this text, and to some, that was a very uncomfortable text for even me to just read out loud in public, right? It's okay to admit that. That feels weird that I just read that. It feels weird to have those words read out loud in a public context, and that's okay. Paul didn't feel weird about it, uh, did he? Uh, if he did, he wouldn't have written it down for them to all hear? Is it something that we all need to hear? Is it something that we all need to hear? All? What if you're not married? What if you're a child? What if you were married, but that was part of a previous time in your life, and now you've gotten older, and that's no longer part of your life? Does it apply to you? These are the things that we actually should consider because if you're at any stage of life in the room today and you're thinking, we're talking about a very narrow subject, but it doesn't seem to relate to me, I just have to tell you that it does relate to you. And that's where I'd like to begin this morning. I'd like to set the stage for that to let you know it does apply, does relate to you. And then I'd like to begin in our text. And so the first thing that I'd like for you to hear this morning is that the church is a preservative of marital intimacy, okay? The church is a preservative of marital intimacy. What in the world does that mean? It's very true, but we should all know because all of us have a part to play in preserving marital intimacy. A few texts. First, Hebrews 13.4. Hebrews 13.4 says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. What did that text just say? Let marriage be held in honor among who? Did did I lose you? Oh, okay. We'll try again. Let marriage be held in honor among All. all. Who does all include? It includes all. It includes all of us. Young, old, married, single. So we should all be concerned about marriage. 
and the details concerning marriage and making sure that we all are in agreement and in support of and doing our part in preserving marital intimacy, preserving marriage in the church. You know, we all have a role to play in doing this. All of us. Likewise, Titus 2, 1 through 10. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. I'll just pause right there. Did you turn to that text, by the way? You're just listening to me read it. You should probably turn there. Titus 2, verses 1 through 10. Ten verses is a good little chunk, so we should look at it together. There's a couple ideas here that I want you to see. That there are different groups within the church labeled here that need to be concerned about stuff like this. So, beginning back at verse 1, as for you, who is this? The one in charge of delivering the scriptures to the people of God. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Are there things about marriage, in particular marital intimacy, that need to be taught to the church? What do you think? Are there things about marital intimacy that would be not in line with sound doctrine? Yes. Are there things about marital intimacy that would be in line with sound doctrine? Yes. And so do we need to then publicly make a distinction between the two? Yes. So should this be taught in the church? Yes. Older men. Uh, there are other reasons. I'm just taking that from this passage. Okay. Older men. There's a group. You hear that group? Any older men in the room? It's okay. I know you are. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Now, I'll pause right there. Older men are going to be models of good behavior to the younger generations in the church. Do you understand that? Whether married or not married, you are a model of good behavior to the rest of the church. And you are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith and in love. And if you are married and you're an older man, you need to be modeling to others in a sound way what marital intimacy is to look like. Right? Older women, likewise. They are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. And they are to teach what is good and train the young women to love their husbands and children. So older women are to be teaching the younger women in the church concerning marriage. So you know you have a job to do. To love their husbands and their children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men. Younger men. There's one thing stated about younger men, and that is... Be self-controlled. Are there implications to younger men being self-controlled and in marital intimacy? I think there are significant implications there. Show yourself, that is the one who's teaching, in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that the opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us and bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters and everything and they are to be well-pleasing and not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God and this applies to all that has been said because what each category and each group is doing, that is older men, Older women, younger men, younger women, that encompasses everybody, because there's only two genders, that encompasses everybody. So everyone has a role to play in adorning. Adorning means to put, to clothe yourself in, right? In clothing yourself in what? What does it say? The doctrine of God. Your way of life ought to be clothed in the doctrine of God. And that includes and actually even specifically includes in this text what it looks like to have intimacy in marriage and to support that idea in all generations. Are you seeing it with me? Are you seeing the big picture of how we all have a role to play here? 
And then I'll just give you one more and we're going to move on through our text. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. It says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? The day we've just been talking about and singing about. There's something for us to do. Let us all consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Does this include marriage, you think? I think so. I think absolutely so. So, it is all of our job. All of us have a job to do as far as this is concerned. Everyone in the room. A lot of different ages here. Everyone in the room has a job to do. We are considering how to stir one another up to love and good works. As is fitting for who we are in the stage of life that we're in. So, I want to address two groups before we really get into our text. I want to address the kids in the room. I want to then address those who are single in the room. Okay? Just for a moment. And then we're going to move in to the text. So, kids, you were coloring or something. Look at me for a second. Okay? Do I have your attention? Yes? All over here? Yes? All mine? Yes? Good? All right. I want to just tell you just a couple of things that you're going to hear a lot of things today from the Word of God, but I want you to hear a few things in particular as we get started. First is you need to know that God has a good design and plan for husbands and wives, which means mommies and daddies. God has a good design for mommies and daddies, for wives, for husbands. God has a plan for mom and dad to be loving and faithful and affectionate with each other. You know what I mean by affectionate? Huh? Some giggling mean yes, okay? It's okay, and not only is it okay, it's not like mommies and daddies get a pass here and God says, well, that's okay, but God said it's actually good that mommies and daddies love each other and care for each other in a very, very sweet way. Do you understand that? It's God's plan for your mommy and daddy to love each other, and this is good, okay? And that's what the, the scriptures are telling us this morning, okay? Got it? Everyone good on that? It's a good plan. may seem weird to kids at times, but it's a good plan. For those who are single in the room, not children, it's very clear from Scripture that the church collectively needs to preserve God's design for marriage. Do you agree with that? The church collectively needs to preserve God's design for marriage. So we need to be building up marriages and families within the church, preserving and fortifying God's plan, which means you are either learning or you are teaching. And of course, we're always learning. But for those who had been married, you have a role to play. For those who are not married yet, you have a role to play. What might this look like in real life as far as this is concerned? Make sure the things we're thinking about, the things we're talking about, and the things that we're celebrating are correct according to Scripture. So the things that you may joke about, which are inappropriate, concerning your wife, making fun of your wife, for example, demeaning her, seeing her as someone other than like separate from yourself, all these kind of derogatory things that people laugh at and celebrate, wrong. That's not okay. This is not the picture of Christ and the church that we get from Scripture. This is not the picture of husbands and wives that we get from Scripture. So everyone in the room has a role to play in making sure that we're all doing, thinking, and behaving in certain ways that are according to good doctrine, concerning all things, but especially concerning, this morning, marriage and marital intimacy. We all have a role to play. Every single one of us. So let's get into our text. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, your text should have this next portion in parentheses, or not parentheses, in quotation marks, excuse me. It should have this in quotation marks. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, end quote. Is that how your Bible has it? 
It should be in a quote. Why? Because as Paul has been doing, he's quoting the Corinthians. Now in this part, he's quoting them not just because he heard them say something, right? Like we talked about last week. But now he's quoting something they actually wrote to him. And they were saying, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So the church was clearly having some significant issues. We already know that. And at least some of them wanted to reach out to Paul and write to him about a few things. <clears throat> Another way of looking at this might be with the idea of a sense of fracturing within the church. Because what did we just come off of? Those who had sexual liberties, right? Right? And then you have another group that says, well, it's good for a man not to, the, the, literally it says touch a woman. It's good for a man not to touch a woman at all, even husbands and wives. That's what's being said. And Paul has a problem with this statement. So this fracturing, that means there's a divide in the church. There was one group that was very liberal, right? I can do whatever I want because my body doesn't matter. They're all going to go away in the end anyway, so do whatever, right? But then there was another group that were, that were the legalists, and they uh, were basically saying, what you do with your body matters, therefore, here are some very strict rules to follow, right? That's the legalist approach. We know that you can't do all things with your body, so let's create rules. Legalists like rules. Let's create rules. Paul didn't give us rules like this, or the scriptures don't give us rules like this, but we're going to create some rules, and we're going to say, don't even touch a woman. It's kind of like Adam and Eve's situation. Don't eat from the tree. Uh, Adam says, evidently, to Eve, well, don't eat from it, and don't even touch it, right? Don't even get near the tree. So we're just adding some additional rules that we think are helpful, but in this case, is that a helpful rule? Don't even touch your spouse? Do you, you think that's a helpful rule? Uh, that's not a helpful rule, and it's a false claim, and Paul is writing about this claim, which is very clearly a false rule. But we do have to ask, why is it false? Is this a true statement? Could it be? But it's actually very easy to settle. Um, I will say this in general, and I'm going to quote just a little bit from Genesis chapter 1. God has called marital intimacy good, not bad. You do know that, right? God has called marital intimacy good. He has not called it bad. Genesis 1.28, what does God say to Adam and Eve? God blessed them and he said to them, that is to husband and wife, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. What did he tell them to do? To engage in marital intimacy. Because if you don't know, that's the only way to multiply and fill the earth. Right? It is God's good plan. It is not a bad plan. Do we all understand? It is a good plan of God. It is not a bad plan. So for those people in the church to then say, that's not a good idea. Husband and wife should not be intimate with each other. You shouldn't touch any woman at all. Of course, that applies both ways, right? But they're saying that plan in the new covenant, in Christ, it's better just to not touch a woman at all. But Paul is saying this is incorrect because God's plan for marital intimacy is actually a good thing, not a bad thing, okay? I would say also as just a side note as we're continuing on that we need to be very careful, generally speaking, about not making legalistic laws that restrict and bind the conscience of other believers beyond the word of God. This is exactly what was happening here. They saw a general concept about how this truth works itself out, sexual immorality bad. Therefore, let's create a bunch of laws to restrict ourselves, even laws that aren't necessary and in fact are actually bad. It could be, some people are just built this way, it seems to me, that they like strict laws and they apply those strict laws to themselves, but then they also turn around and say, everyone must follow these strict laws, when God never made that law. That's, that's a legalistic approach to Scripture, okay? Laws that force others to call something good that God has not called good would be a legalistic approach. Laws that force others to call something bad that God has not called, that God has not called bad is also a legalistic approach, right? You say, that thing is bad. But you say, 
I don't know that that's true. In fact, I, I see that in Scripture, and God never called that bad. Why are you calling it bad? Because they see that it could lead down a path that could be destructive and bad, and so they want to put a law, a gate up really, really close so that that just never happens. But God never made that law. You made that law, and you're imposing it on others. That's legalism. We need to be very careful to not go down that path. Understood? Uh, you can find more about that in Romans 14, verses 5 through 12. I'll just read verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while, uh, while another esteems all days alike, and each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. What day for Christians pops into your mind? Sunday? That Sunday is God's special holy day, right? That Sunday was never God's special holy day. If you're looking for that day, that's actually Saturday. That's the seventh day, not the first day. Okay, um, but there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, as Scripture says, and all who come to Christ have entered that rest. There is an ultimate spiritual rest that that temporary rest was pointing to, and that, te- that, that ultimate rest is in Christ himself. He is our Sabbath rest. Okay, we have rested from our labors. Now, that still being the case, you can hold Sundays as more significant than others and me say, but it's not more significant than others. All days are the same. And for us to be okay to live in that world where you see one day is better than another and I don't. Scripture specifically says you need to be okay with that. But everyone needs to be convinced in their own mind. So do you see how there's diversity within the body that is also unified? A unified body is also a diversified body, and that is okay. That's how it's going to be. Okay? If we're looking to be in a group of people that believe every single detail, just like we believe, you're going to not find a church. You're going to make your own church, and you'll probably be the only member of it (laughs) forever. That's just how it'll be. There's no one that's going to agree with you on every single point. Okay? Okay? So a certain group in the Corinthian church had become convinced about something and they created legalistic boundaries for everyone, right? Isn't that what happened? However, the thing they were convinced of was not a matter of conscience that they were actually free to decide on. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, and listen to the things that they force on other people, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God has created to be received from thanksgiving. So do you see what some want to do? They want to say, don't get married, bad. Don't eat all these different little foods here, bad. And they're creating, they're saying that certain things are bad that God never called bad. We need to be very careful that we're not doing that. And if you think that you're, you know, immune, you're not immune. I, I bet you, if pressed, we can find that thing in you that you already have that, actually. Some of you have a lot of those things. Some of you have a few that I guarantee you have at least one. Something you call bad. You don't know why you do that, right? Okay, we'll have the whole, should Christians have Christmas trees conversation, okay? And you get where this goes, right? So, we need to understand God has called marital intimacy, what? Good, not bad. Are we very clear on that issue? Okay, so this was their statement. What does it say in verse 2? But, Paul says, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. All right, this next idea is that marital intimacy, along with being a good design of God, that is, marital intimacy is part of God's good design. Second, we might say, marital intimacy is a preventive against sexual immorality. Marital intimacy is a preventive against sexual immorality. And was sexual immorality an issue for them? And so some were saying, so this is a weird situation, isn't it? Some were saying, don't touch any woman, including your spouse. 
and there you have someone going off and committing sexual immorality, is it, could it be the case that because of this restriction that was laid upon this man, he was prone to sexual immorality because rules were placed on him? Just think of how this applies in the Roman Catholic Church, for example, right? Restrict this, you can touch no one, and it builds something up inside of you. So specifically, Paul is saying that marital intimacy is actually a preventive against sexual immorality, right? A more literal rendering of this might say, but because of sexual immoralities, each man is to have or be having, it's a present active, his own wife. Each woman is to have or be having her own husband. You understand? Each man is to be having his own wife. Each woman is to be having her own husband because of sexual immorality. You hear it? This is how it should be. And if this is not how it is, then there will be temptation to sexual immorality. So it adds potential insight, doesn't it, into all that's happening here. But here's the explicit sexual ethic of Scripture on this issue. Any and all activity, sexual activity, outside of the marriage relationship is called sexual immorality. And it's very clear right here. He says, because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man, each one, is to be having his own wife or vice versa, right? Because it's the only way to not commit sexual immorality. You hear it? It's the only way to avoid sexual immorality is with a husband and a wife. Therefore, it's very restrictive, isn't it? The only way to avoid sexual immorality is to have a spouse. There it is. Any activity outside of having a spouse is sexual immorality. Now, I say that, and I'm trying to say it emphatically because our culture disagrees with this completely. And this mindset creeps into the church. And you know it. I don't have to explain that. You know that. We need to be very careful to allow our sexual ethic to be derived from Scripture itself and not from our culture. Because if we derive our sexual ethic from culture, what's it going to tell us? Do whatever you want. Whenever you want, with whoever you want, and create your own identity, whatever that is. That's what the culture will tell us. That is not what Scripture says. That is not what Scripture says. Scripture says the only way to be engaged in sexual activity and avoid sexual immorality is to have a spouse. And within that context, each uh, husband is to be having his wife and each wife is to be having her husband. That's the design of God. And is that design good or bad or weird? Good. That is a good design of God. Okay? There is an imperative here. Actually, when it says each one is to be having, that's in the imperative. That's a command. You are to be having your spouse. You follow? That's actually a command in Scripture. Now, we're going to get to some more details here because this is not all that's said in this passage, but it actually is a command in Scripture. Why? Because of the temptation to sexual immorality. Marital intimacy is not only okay if it happens, it's actually a command of God to keep you and your spouse from sexual sin. It's about the proper, healthy, ongoing lifestyle that God intends for a husband and a wife. Spouse, do you want your spouse to be tempted to sexual immorality? So this has implications. Next, verse 3. And I'd like to read verses 3 through 6 together as a unit, okay? In this, we're going to see that marital intimacy is a place of mutuality. Mutuality. Verses 3 through 6. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For... 
the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, actually it says in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, as a concession, not a command, I say this. Okay? Three ideas will flow from these verses here. And the first one is this. In this idea of mutuality, there is, first of all, a mutual debt. Look at verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. Do you all see that in your text? It literally says, the husband is to be paying to his wife what is owed to her. And in the same way, the wife to her husband. I'm going to say that again because it's worded a little different in your Bible. The husband is to be paying. Again, that is in the active present tense. And <clears throat> these tenses really do matter because it's not meant to be a one-time action that you do and it's done, right? Like get married. Are you to be getting married? No, you don't get married. You are to be, be being married, but you're not to be getting married. You only do that once, right? You following what I'm saying? But here, what's, what's being said is it's not a one-time activity that you're done with. It's an ongoing activity, present active tense. It's an activity that continues, and it's intended to continue. The husband is to be paying to his wife what is owed to her. And in the same way, the wife to her husband is to be paying. There's a debt. What debt? There's a debt to be paid to your spouse, unless you think Paul is wrong. Because that's literally what he just said. Okay? When you are married, when you become married, okay, for those of you who are not yet, who will by God's own timing and action, maybe you will be married one day, you need to understand that when you become married, that you enter into an arrangement where there is a mutual debt to be paid. It's continual. There is a continual mutual debt, and it's not as though the husband has more debt or the wife has more debt to pay. It is 100% equal debt. Do you hear me on that? The debt is equal. It is a mutual debt that needs to be paid. A continual debt of what? Well, what's the context? Marital intimacy. Do you see it? There is a continual debt of marital intimacy to be paid to your spouse. That is what Paul said. And so, because that debt is there, the husband is to be paying that debt to his wife, and the wife is to be paying that debt to her husband. But don't hear what the text is not saying. I just want to clarify. Don't hear what's not being said. I think a lot of us, that we do that. We fill in gaps with what we think we're hearing, with all the other possible options. That Only hear what's being said. Don't hear what's not being said. For example, it does not say, listen to this. this I, I really want to make sure this right here is heard. It does not say, husbands, ensure that your wives pay their debts. Likewise, it does not say, wives, ensure your husbands are paying their debts. Do you hear that? The command, the imperative, is placed on the one giving, not the one receiving. This is very important. The imperative is on the, is on the husband to do his part, on the wife to do her part. The debt of marital intimacy is never to be taken by force. Is that what you read here? Take your debt by force and say, pay what you owe me. Is that what you read here? I hope not. You would be wrong. You would be very wrong to hear that in this text. You understand? That's not what it says. But how can this be, we might ask, about this mutuality, this mutual debt? Isn't the husband in a position of authority over the wife? 
This seems to be what Paul says in other places. Shouldn't she be in submission to him as the head of the relationship always, including this? Isn't his duty, his responsibility to ensure that the marriage is biblical after all? And that's when we get to verse four. Mutual authority. The marital intimacy is, marital intimacy is a place of mutuality and it comes to mutual debts, but not only that, but also mutual authority. Verse four. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And possibly you stop reading right there. But actually what it says is, likewise, or in the exact same manner, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Mutual authority. It is the same concerning marital intimacy. Do you hear it? Do you see it? I hope that you do. It may say something like this, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. So in the same way, there's no sense in which the husband has more authority over the wife's body than she does over his. Unless, again, you think Paul was wrong about this. He wasn't married. Maybe he just didn't get it. And maybe he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to author these things at other times, but maybe not here because he just didn't know. He didn't have the real, he didn't have firsthand experience being married, so how does he know? Uh, if that's your approach, that, that's dead wrong, okay? Paul did know by means of the Holy Spirit, okay? He was an apostle of Jesus Christ meant to teach his church, and this is correct. It's not wrong. There is mutual authority when it comes to the body concerning sexual and marital intimacy, okay? He's actually already used this word authority in another place, and that's in chapter 6, verse 12. And he said, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. That word dominated is the same word authority here. One who dominates or something that has, has the power to dominate, right? That's the word authority here. Power over. That's what it means. The wife has equal power over the body of the husband that the husband does over the wife. It's equal. If husbands and wives have authority over one another's bodies, then there are some implications that follow. If the husband, listen, if the husband wants to do something with his body, the wife has authority over that thing. Did you hear that? How can that be? Because the wife has authority over her husband's body. So if the husband wants to do something with his body, who has authority over that? Oh, the wife does. If the wife wants to do something with her body, the husband has authority over that thing that she wants to do. Why? Because, specifically concerning marital intimacy, there is mutual authority. So although you may want to do something with your body, guess what? You're not in authority here. That just changed things forever, didn't it? You're not in charge here. There is a mutual authority here. By the way, if husbands and wives want to do anything with their bodies, the Lord has authority over their bodies. You know that this continues down a farther track, right? It's that although the husband has authority over his wife's body, the wife has, a, has authority over her husband's body, guess what? Both of your bodies are under a greater authority and that authority is Christ himself. Ephesians 5 for reference on that. Let's look at the last section. We're talking about mutuality, that in marital intimacy, that's a place of mutuality, there is a mutual debt that's true. There is mutual authority that is true, but then there is also mutual agreement. Verses five and six, and it says, do not deprive one another. Just full stop right there. Do you hear that? Is it strange? Can we just take a pause for a second? Is it strange that scripture speaks to this? For some, I think it may be. Do you know what I think is also strange is that we avoid things like this and don't talk about them and then our kids grow up and they're confused? 
or we never know, so we're confused throughout our whole life. We don't know how to operate within a marriage because we just don't ever talk about this stuff. Scripture talks about it, so we should talk about it. Do you agree? And it says specifically in verse 5, do not deprive one another. Which means, actually, that you are capable of depriving your spouse. Because your spouse is not able to demand of you what you're not freely giving. Did you hear that? Your spouse is not able to demand of you what you are not freely giving, so it is within your power to deprive your spouse. But you are not to deprive one another. You just shouldn't. Except, he adds, perhaps by agreement for a limited time, literally it says for a season, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Okay, what it's saying here is, Literally, do not be defrauding one another. Don't rob each other, except for a season, by agreement. Robbing each other, what, what could I possibly be robbing you of? The debt that you owe to your spouse. You owe your spouse a debt. And to not pay that debt, or to refuse that payment is given to that debt, is to deprive your spouse, to defraud, to rob them of what is theirs. And Paul says not to do that. I will again add here, there is no license for selfish demands here. For example, do you think that Philippians 2.3 applies to all situations except for this realm? Philippians 2.3, by the way, says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Do you think that that applies also to this realm? I'd say, yeah, it does because there's no exception, right? See the footnote, does not include marital intimacy. That's not true. It applies everywhere. And certainly it also applies here. So some were saying it's more godly to abstain from marital intimacy, right? That's what they were saying. Paul refutes this idea entirely by saying a spouse is not allowed to do that. To say, Listen, I'm depriving us of this part of our relationship because it's just more godly. If I just don't touch you and you don't touch me, we're probably better off. It's more godly, don't you think? More holy. Wrong. It's not more holy. It's worse. Basically, that spouse would be saying, I'm forcing both of us into a life of marital celibacy based on my own convictions of personal holiness. And you're not allowed to do that. There seems to be a connection also here between a person's prayer life and that of a relationship to the spouse. And Peter confirms this, 1 Peter 3, 7, when he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of, of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Did you hear that? There is a connection between your relationship with your spouse and your prayer life. Paul says it here, and Peter also confirms this idea. We need to learn to live in this marriage relationship and not only learn to live in it, but to grow up into it and understand what it is one day, but then also to be beyond it in teaching previous or uh, future generations about how this is to look in their life. We need to be encouraging one another with these things and saying that idea that you have about marriage is not biblical. The thing that you're celebrating or joking around about right now is not something that the Bible celebrates or thinks is funny. You understand the implications there? We hold one another accountable to these truths. The reason the couple needs to come back together again is because of the reality that no one has perfect self-control, unless you think you do. You think you have perfect self-control. Don't worry about me. I'll never be tempted. That's not true. No one has perfect self-control. And he says, now I say this as a concession, not as a command. What does he say as a concession, not a command? All of what was just said? No. He's saying, do not deprive one another, except, this is the concession, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this limited time thing in order to pray. 
But if you think that you need time from your spouse for a season in order to devote yourself to the Lord, then only by agreement can you do that, should you do that, so that you might devote yourselves to the Lord. But then he says, but be sure that you come back together again. You know why? Because of sexual immorality and self-control so that Satan may not tempt you. Do you want your spouse to be tempted to sexual immorality? Do you want, single person, whether young or old, do you want people in this room to be tempted by sexual immorality? No, I hope that's not your goal. So what should you be encouraging, supporting, teaching? The biblical truths of what Scripture has to say about marital intimacy. Does God have a good plan for marriage? Yes, and are we in full support of God's good plan? Yes, do we want to encourage and teach one another all the more as we see the day drawing near? Yes, we do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for its power and its impact in our lives. And even as we take a section of scripture that you have by your own providence and design and your own sovereignty, Uh, We have arrived at that text today, and so I pray that upon the hearing and explaining of your word that you would teach us all, that you would work powerfully in our lives to help us understand how this might apply in our lives, that we might be faithful to you. We desire to be faithful in all things, and that also includes in our marriages and in what kind of marriage we support should we not be married. So Lord, give us help. Help us to see what our role is to play here in faithfulness to your word. We pray this together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and sing one more song together. is to
Let's all pray together. Lord, again, we're just so grateful, God, for your word. Lord, help us to live a faithful life to you and to the commands that you've given us. Lord, again, we thank you so much for sending your son to this earth, God, to die for our sins. God, that we may find life in him. Lord, help us to share your goodness and your gospel with others. And may you be glorified in the way that we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Or you guys can be seated for just a moment. Um, 